So we'll start with the breaking start of the community group. All right. So first of all, thank you very much for having me here. Thank you very much, Miriam, Jonathan, and the organizers for putting this program together and uh, also uh, giving me the chance to present our work. I'm also very happy to be uh, back at PEM after uh, several years. And um, okay, so I, I like to talk about uh, black hole entropy, the species scale, and uh, topological strings. In some sense, it's, uh, this talk can be even seen as a continuation of my last year's talk uh, in uh, Utrecht, uh, which was organized I think, by uh, Thomas. So uh, let's get started then. And um, I have to get familiar with the... Okay, so let me start uh, by making some general remarks about uh, quantum, gravi uh, quantum gravity. Uh, namely, quantum gravity uh, possesses some uh, generic features. First of all, that all uh, mass scales depend on a scalar field. So whenever we talk about certain mass scales, uh, at the end, there will be field-dependent uh, quantities. Uh, second of all, and I regard this as very important, there is a, a notion of UV-IR mixing, that the UV scales talk to the IR scales, and we will see uh, also how it is implemented in uh, concrete uh, examples. Then uh, let me just right away introduce the relevant UV cutoff scale in uh, quantum gravity. And uh, I will take it as a so-called species scale. So lambda quantum gravity, so how is the species scale defined? Uh, it is defined um, as uh, the Planck mass divided uh, by N uh, with a power one over D minus two where n is the number of uh, light particles, the number of species uh, basically below the cutoff scale lambda to qg. And uh, since n uh, is bigger than one, you see that the cutoff scale uh, always has to be smaller than the Planck mass, which is 10 to 19 dV. And uh, also the number of species, uh, this number n uh, will depend on scalar fields. So the cutoff scale in this way will be also a field dependent quantity. So um, I think um, the, uh, the uh, so-called swamplet scenario uh, puts a very nice uh, setting for these uh, general uh, features. And I like to uh, quote the most, or one of the most important swamplet conjecture, conjectures. It is called the swamplet distance conjecture. So it's a little bit uh, awkward that one cannot see the, the top of the screen. Uh, but I, uh, I think uh, you all know uh, that uh, at large, a large distance is data in the parameter space of uh, quantum gravity or string vacua. There must, must be an infinite tower of states with some uh, typical mass scale m. And this uh, mass scale m depends exponentially as e to the minus alpha delta, alpha delta uh, on the distance. Um, so uh, obviously for large field extensions for large distances in the moduli space in the field space, this mass scale M uh, can uh, become very low. And uh, as you will see, it will also lower the cutoff. And uh, this is a generic picture. We have a tower of states which starts at some particular uh, low energy scale, a small M, and then basically it continues up to the scale lambda QG, but generically it can also continue to the scale of quantum gravity. Also, we have less information here because uh, uh, above lambda QG, uh, gravity becomes strong. Sorry. Okay. Um, so, um, what, what could these uh, tower of states be? There's a very nice uh, conjecture about that. It is a so called um, 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 yeah, string distance conjecture uh, saying that uh, the uh, it's the emer emergent string conjecture saying that the light tower of states at large distances is given either by light string excitations or so called KK modes, which arise uh, due to compactification, as uh, proposed by Lerche and Weigand. So, uh, let me first briefly look uh, at the uh, string species. So we know that in string theory, there's a Regge uh, tower of uh, states. Uh, uh, so the tower goes with some particular number or the square root of N. 
And uh, as we uh, discussed uh, some time ago, and also uh, there's a nice paper by Dwali and uh, Gomez about it, one can view uh, the string coupling constant or the inverse of one over GS square as the effective number of species. So if you apply the previous formula about the cutoff scale, uh, you get that uh, lambda QG is MP times GS uh, with a power two over D minus two. And this precisely agrees with the string scale in D dimensions. So you see that the species scale here is in fact nothing else than the string scale. So this works very nicely. Uh, the other option is that the tower of state is given uh, by uh, the KK modes. Apparently this does not really work so well. Yeah. So um, in this case, we have a KK tower uh, of state. So the, the onset, the typical uh, tower mass scale given by uh, the, the size of the compact dimension. So it's given by one over R and the distance therefore is given by the log of the R. We have a KK tower, uh, which is spaced by some KK num quantum number N. And then again, you can count, here it's uh, quite easy. You can count the number of states is given um, uh, by uh, the cutoff scale over MKK raised to the power little n, where little n is the number of the extra dimensions. And if you look, uh, this is precisely nothing else than the volume of the uh, extra dimension space measured in units uh, of the uh, lambda to G scale. And again, you can apply the formula now and you get for the species scale this particular expression in terms of MKK or in terms of one over R. So you see that also the number uh, of extra dimensions enters here. And again, this agrees with some formula which was known uh, before, namely this is nothing else than the Planck mass in the four plus N uh, dimensions. So all this uh, fits very nicely together. And uh, then you can also com consider a combined number of species N, which is the volume of the compact space times uh, GS to the minus uh, two here in, uh, here in four dimensions. But um, there's a very nice application uh, of this. Uh, or if, if you wish a generalization of the distance conjecture, this is called the anti de Sitter uh, or the Sitter uh, distance conjecture. Here, there's a tower mass scale. I just want to mention this briefly, uh, which is given in terms of the cosmological constant. So a certain power of the cosmological constant, we can also introduce an additional extra parameter, uh, lambda to the minus one. And again, if you put this together, you get for the species scale, this uh, expression, which uh, again depends on a certain power of the cosmological constant. And I regard this also as a very nice example of what I call UVI mixing at the beginning, because you see that the UV cutoff scale really depends essentially on the infrared scale, which is a cosmological constant in this case. Uh, as I said, the dark universe is a very nice application here, uh, putting in experimental constraints. Uh, one has to uh, choose for the number of extra dimensions in the one. The parameter alpha is fixed to be one quarter, and also this parameter lambda uh, can be determined. And then it turns out that the radius of the dark dimension of this extra dimension uh, is about uh, one micrometer, which is even accessible uh, to future experiments. So you see there's a very dense uh, tower of state in this case. Uh, but um, applying this formula, uh, you get that the related species scale is now of the order of uh, 10 to 10 uh, GV. There is also uh, another um, relation of towers to uh, another parameter in the effective action, which is the gravitino mass. And this is called the gravitino uh, conjecture. So uh, in this case, the tower of scale can be related to the gravitino mass, again, with some uh, particular parameter. Oops. some particular power uh, uh, beta. And uh, if you assume, if, if you put this together with the dark universe or with a cosmological constant conjecture, if you assume that the tower, uh, um, if there's only one tower, if you fix this parameter, then you get another prediction and that the Susie breaking scale is of, the, is of the order of lambda to the one uh, power one eight, which is in the TV region, it should be also accessible for experiments. And this is something we discussed recently uh, with Luis Antodocchi, Ignatius Antoniadis, Niccolo Cribiori, and uh, Marcus Calidi. And I think Ignatius will also expand on this uh, in his talk. Good. 
So, uh, so far, actually, we have considered the number of species and the cutoff for the case that uh, we are, so to say, uh, are at large volume, at large radii, uh, or at, uh, at weak uh, string coupling. But uh, let us now ask the question if we can also uh, can derive uh, the species scale or the number of species for general uh, Calabria compactification. And in fact, there's a very nice proposal, very interesting proposal, which was made uh, end of uh, last year. And uh, I just realized I missed one author, I'm missing one author here, who, so I really apologize for this. But in any case, there's this proposal of these uh, four uh, gentlemen. And uh, the proposal is that the number of species uh, can be expressed in terms of, uh, in terms of a topological uh, number, which is called F1, which itself, uh, as we will see, also then depends uh, on the uh, on is field dependent uh, or background dependent. Uh, and again, therefore, N uh, will be a, a field dependent quantity. What is F1? F1 is a part of the so called topological string partition function. So I will not here introduce the topological string, but uh, in the topological string, you have a topological partition function with some associated free energy. And you can perform a genus expansion of this free energy. So F in general is an infinite sum. It starts with genus zero and then continues. And uh, F1 is precisely uh, the uh, second or the first uh, uh, term in this expansion. So uh, it, uh, it, it, it is related to the free energy at genus one. And concretely, it can be ex expressed for Calabria compactifications as an integral over the second uh, term class where J is a uh, so-called Keller class. And um, as you will see later, you can, it can be also expanded in terms of uh, the moduli, in terms of the scalar field. And then the C2i's are the uh, so-called uh, second uh, term uh, numbers. So this is a topological quantity. And uh, in fact, in this paper, where I've missed one also, unfortunately, there were given several arguments uh, for this hypothesis. One argument is uh, looking at the spectrum of the Laplacian in the so-called topological B model. And the uh, second argument is that uh, F1 can be also regarded as a so-called A function in a related four-dimensional CFT that counts the number of degrees of freedom. And I think also several uh, good examples were given uh, in this paper. However, what we like to do now is uh, to give uh, in a, unfortunately, again, we are, we are missing uh, the first uh, line here. Uh, what I like to do now is uh, to derive this uh, uh, assertion, this hypothesis that N is F1 uh, in a different way, namely using a black hole or black hole arguments. So I, I like to prevent a complementary uh, derivation of the same uh, formula by using black holes and uh, in relation with the effective uh, field theory. So uh, why I like to use a uh, black hole? In fact, I think it is already known uh, uh, for some time that uh, the black hole entropy indeed contains some information about the number of species. And the argument roughly goes as follows. If you look at the black hole entropy, if you look at the black hole entropy uh, in D dimensions, it is given uh, by the black hole, the Schwarzschild radius with the power D minus two times the appropriate powers of the Planck mass. So S is a dimensionless quantity. And um, with that, we can associate also another scale to the theory, the black hole mass scale, which is just the inverse of the Schwarzschild radius. So MP over S uh, to the power one over D minus two. And if you compare this uh, formula with the formula for the species, you will see that it is basically the same formula, uh, only that N and S are uh, exchanged. The number of species is exchanged by the Black hole entropy. Of course, it is very reasonable to assume that in effective feed theory, uh, this, uh, the, the scale, uh, the cutoff scale, is always or has always to be bigger than the scale of the uh, black hole. And therefore, we get as a bound for the number of species uh, precisely the entropy of a particular black hole. N always has to be smaller than S. So, um, the way now uh, to uh, derive uh, the number of species is basically to look at some kind of smallest possible black holes with uh, the minimal possible entropy. And this will then determine the number of species in the effective theory. And this is basically the black hole argument which we are going, uh, going to use. 
Um, another way to see why black holes have to do with the tower of states and the species is the so-called black hole entropy conjecture, which in particular holds for large uh, black hole entropies. And here the statement similar uh, to the other distance uh, arguments, I'm sorry for that, uh, is uh, that there's a tower of states which case uh, inverse uh, with the black hole entropy again raised with some power, is something we post uh, some uh, years ago with Bonfoy, Chiambelli, and uh, Severin Lus, and we also worked on that uh, last year with Cremiori Dirigel, with Marcos Dirigel, Alessandro Nieki, and uh, Marcos Calisi. And um, this test uh, also worked nicely. Uh, in fact, uh, you may ask, uh, how can we relate this uh, to the uh, distance conjectures so far, or in what way also the black holes can be related uh, to the internal modular space? This was also uh, discussed in another uh, interesting paper by Delgado, Montero, and Wafa uh, last year. And it can be used, in fact, to test uh, geometry by the black hole entropy. Uh, the tool here are, in fact, the attractor equations uh, for black holes in N equals 2 supergravity. So the attractor equations then will then uh, connect the modular space of some uh, effective field theory to the black hole entropy. In this way, also, the black hole entropy will become a field dependent quantity, at least uh, um, what the scalar fields at the horizon concern. So, as I just said, our strategy to deriving the number of species is look for the smallest possible black hole probes with some particular charges. So, we now define S as the minimum of some particular black hole entropy. So, let us give a few examples. The easiest example, I think, which you can uh, imagine is some uh, heterotic. Uh, black holes, uh, Gerizen heterotic string theory, with one single magnetic charge and one single electric charge, um, then the uh, entropy can be nicely expressed in terms of the square of the magnetic charges, say, times uh, Gs to the minus two, where G is the heterotic string coupling. Uh, in fact, Gs to the minus two is just given by the ratio uh, at the horizon of uh, Q or P. So if you put this back, you get the familiar formula that the entropy is just the product of uh, P times Q. And now, um, what is the smallest uh, possible black hole? Uh, we want to eliminate also all charge dependence from this formula. So we choose P equal to one. And then you see that the minimal black hole entropy that would be the smallest black hole here in this context, the entropy of the smallest possible black hole is just given by basically one over GS square. And this we have already identified as the number of species before. So this is a nice example where our method works very well. Good. So now let us, con let us continue and uh, switch to N equals two supergravity. I have already mentioned uh, the uh, attractor equations. So here I display the effective action of N equals two supergravity. Uh, it starts in the first line with the so-called two derivative action. We have uh, the standard Einstein form, and we have the, uh, the kinetic terms of the uh, scalar field with some particular metric. We have also uh, the gauge kinetic terms with some uh, U1, with some abelian heat strength, again, with some particular coupling fun uh, function. But then in addition, uh, quite important for us, there's an additional piece in the effective action, which is not a uh, two derivative, but a uh, four derivative. So it's basically given by trace R, which star R. And again, there's a coupling constant in front of it, namely uh, the product of the uh, second term numbers C2i times the imaginary part of the scalar fields Vi. So just maybe to set the make the notation clear, we are in uh, N equals two supergravity. We have vector multiplets, uh, X lambda, where lambda goes from zero to the number of vector multiplets. We have associated scalar fields, one less. We define the scalar fields in uh, this way as the ratios of the axis. And then, as I have mentioned already, we have the second churn numbers, which are defined by this integral, where omega i um, is, uh, um, is a two form in the second cohomology class of the, of the, uh, the Calabriau manifold. Okay, so this is the, uh, uh, our model, which we like to uh, consider. And uh, then if we go on uh, in the formalism of uh, N equals two supergravity now, including this higher derivative term that is important, 
again, there's a prepotential, but now the prepotential, including the higher derivative term, uh, depends on two background fields, X and A. So A uh, is perhaps a little bit unfamiliar, uh, but uh, for people who know any supergravity, uh, it is a, a well-known gravity photon field. And uh, we can now expand this prepotential again in terms of some number. Uh, G is not really a genus here, but it's a number in a way basically in counting uh, the derivative order of the effective action and uh, the uh, parameter in which we expand uh, A to the G is precisely the gravity photon field. So then we can uh, continue with the uh, formalism of n equals two supergravity. There's a Keller potential, which depends on uh, the axis, x bar lambda uh, uh, times f lambda, where the f lambdas are the derivatives of this prepotential with respect to the scalar fields. So we get this formula for the uh, scalar potential. And uh, now, again, we are missing uh, the, the header. Uh, we, are look, uh, we are looking at uh, charged black hole solutions in n equals two supergravity. They are characterized by, uh, sorry for that. Uh, they are characterized by electric and magnetic charges. So for each two gauge fields, one can introduce in general one electric charge Q lambda and one uh, dual magnetic charge P lambda. Then there's a cent there, there's an N equals two central charge, which is given by this formula. So Z is e to the K over two uh, times X lambda times the um, electric charges Q lambda minus F lambda times the magnetic charges P lambda. So uh, in order now uh, to, uh, uh, to derive the relation between the charges and the scalar fields, one uses the attractor equations. And what the attractor equations do, uh, very briefly, you can start with some arbitrary values of the scalar fields, say, at the spatial infinity. And then all scalar fields are attracted to the horizon uh, to some particular values. Uh, and these uh, values at the scalar fields are precisely given by those equations. And again, you see that for the Q lambda, also the background field A appears in the second uh, attractor equation. Uh, another important piece of information is that for the black holes we are considering, uh, the gravity photon background is uh, uh, a pure constant. So in some normalization, it's given by minus 64. And finally, the area of the horizon is nothing else than ZZ bar the square of the central charge. Uh, and this can be nicely expressed also in terms of the Keller potential in this way. So that's basically all what we need from uh, N equals two supergravity to study our uh, black hole solutions. And uh, now, uh, so let's do this. And here, there's perhaps a little surprise that uh, uh, when one takes into account, this is again written here in the first line, um, when one takes into account the higher order correction, the black hole entropy is not anymore given by the Beckin Hawking uh, formula is not uh, entirely anymore given by the area of the horizon. However, there's important correction term which comes from the four derivative part of the effective action. And uh, to derive it, one uh, very nice uh, uh, way to derive it is a so-called Ward formula where one takes the derivative of the effective action of the Lagrangian with respect uh, to the Riemann tensor. And then we indeed see that the black hole entropy has two uh, contributions. The first contribution we call as zero and the second contribution as one. And they precisely uh, correspond that the first contribution is ZZ bar. So this is nothing else than the area of the horizon. And uh, then uh, in the presence of uh, higher derivative terms of the effective action, the higher order terms to the entropy are precisely given by FA, where FA here is now meant to be the A derivative of the prepotential. So I think this formula was uh, derived first in a nice paper by Cardozo, uh, David and Mohawk uh, some years ago. And it's really the key also to understand the black hole entropy uh, in any two supergravity. One can also introduce uh, uh, a certain function, we call it F lambda here, which is the real part of the axis. Um, one can also introduce a second function, uh, calligraphic F, which is the imaginary part of F such that uh, the uh, uh, electric charges are just the deriv derivatives of calligraphic F with respect to pi. And then you can see that the entropy is in fact the, the Legendre transform of a so-called free black hole energy uh, in this way, 
And uh, using this, I think this was first done by Oguri, Strominger, and Wafa, and then also further explored uh, by Cardoso, David Keppeli, and Mohaupt. And in this way, one can also introduce a so-called black hole partition function, the black hole, uh, which can be seen as the exponent of the free energy of the black hole. So F is the free energy, and S is the entropy, and they are related um, by this uh, standard kind of uh, thermodynamic genre transformation. And I will come uh, back, and I will come back to this relation at the very end of my talk. Okay, so now uh, let us uh, take some particular specific model, namely I will take type 2a in a Calabria manifold. Uh, I will uh, uh, restrict uh, my uh, discussion to the first and the second term in the expansion of the uh, free potential. So we have an F0 plus F1 times A. The F0, the zeroth order free potential is just given by the standard uh, cubic expression where the Cijk are now given in terms of the triple intersection number of the uh, uh, Calabiao uh, um, four cycles. So this is uh, the zeroth order in F1. Again, it's uh, determined by the Chern uh, number C2i times uh, the scalar fields Vi here expressed in terms of Xi over X0. I choose here uh, one, uh, the case where we have only one electric charge, uh, but a bunch of magnetic charges Pi, which are associated to the various two or four cycles, which I've introduced. So now I can uh, use the Attractor equation. Uh, uh, I told you the Attractor equation fixes the model I um, at the horizon in terms of the charges. So here it is. Uh, in fact, uh, the ZIs are nothing else than the tube cycle volumes at the horizon, and they are given by this expression. So uh, again, we see uh, two contributions. Uh, uh, the first contribution basically is given by this term here. So this comes from the zeros order of the potential. But there's another contribution here, which comes from the second uh, term in the prepotential. And finally, the same is true for the entropy. The entropy also now contains two terms. This term uh, is the area of the horizon, but we have this very important second term, which is determined by the churn numbers of the Calabria manifold. And in fact, this was very nice to see that this uh, formula precisely agrees with the microscopic entropy uh, 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 formula. Uh, by MSW following the uh, uh, following basically the paper by Wafa and Strominger. So you can also count the microscopic degrees of freedom for this kind of black hole and you get 100% uh, you get a precise match with this formula. So if you wish you could have started already with this formula at the very beginning and then uh, rederive it uh, a posteriori also in, uh, in supergravity. Okay, so now let's see how, how we relate this uh, to the number of species. And I do it in two steps. So in the first step, let me uh, put F1 to zero. So again, I look only at the classical uh, grid potential. And uh, in this case, the entropy uh, can be expressed uh, in terms of the magnetic charges in this way. This is uh, based on some uh, previous work, which I have mentioned before. Uh, and uh, what you can do, you can write the entropy in such a way that you can eliminate the electric charge and you can eliminate it in terms of the volume of the Calabriau space, similar like before I have eliminated the string coupling constant uh, um, in terms of one charge. So this is the entropy, uh, the same uh, formula for the entropy here only now only with the magnetic charges and the volume of the space. Uh, in fact, uh, V0 uh, can be expressed in terms of the charges in this way. So if you would reinsert this, you would get, uh, you would get uh, back the previous uh, formula. Now we can again, now coming back to our original problem, we want to determine the number of species from the entropy. So what we can do is basically uh, we can put all the magnetic charges again to one, right? So this is the minimal, minimalistic, the minimal choice, or say better in this case, uh, we put this product over the intersection numbers times the magnetic charges equal to one. So the prefactor is basically one and the minimal entropy is uh, two pi V zero with the power one third. And I think this is also, this is interesting and also makes sense. So the number of species is now given by the third power of the overall volume of the Calabiao space. And we, we had to sort, we had to think a little bit about this, but I think it makes sense because uh, if you wish now the black holes 
probe, probe, a probing the KK tower of a two cycle, which is a minimal cycle in the Calabriao, and the two cycle precisely scales like uh, V to the one third. So I think this is also uh, a nice and a correct result. Uh, and uh, finally, now in my in my last step, I want to include the uh, the uh, this, uh, the next term in the expansion. And uh, I just uh, uh, repeat. Uh, I just show you again the previous formula uh, for the entropy. And now what we can do is, in a way, we can go to the small entropy limit. We can set all uh, charges pi uh, equal to zero, say except to one. Or in other words, we can set this product to zero and say keep only uh, one of the magnetic charges, uh, not to have the entropy completely zero, but look uh, uh, look at the minimal uh, entropy. So uh, if we do this, say if we keep uh, only pi in this expansion, we get as the formula for the minimal entropy this precise uh, this precise expression where basically only the second term survives. And now if we compare with the definition of the L1. Uh, this minimal entropy is precisely two pi times f1, and therefore we conclude that the number of species is uh, two pi times f1, which precisely agrees with the uh, paper, uh, with the previous paper I have mentioned before. So I'm basically done now. Uh, maybe just two more uh, remarks. One remark I have basically made already. So the, uh, note that for this choice of charges, our classical vo volume is infinite. If you look at the previous formula, but the classical entropy would be zero. So um, we would be still in a regime where the effective heat theory is valid because we are at large volume, but we would enter a um, very small entropy limit, which uh, I guess uh, has its uh, own uh, problems. And therefore precisely the second term is important, which removes, which brings us back from zero entropy to finite entropy and allows us to derive this formula. Again, we could re-express also uh, here everything in terms of volume by using this formula and then we would see this is not anymore now the classical volume that the quantum corrected volume V is given by Q square over F1. And uh, I think this also uh, makes a nice, nice sense. Good. So I'm basically at the end. I'd like to make uh, one uh, last uh, remark, uh, namely, as we have seen here, uh, this uh, entropy uh, is given by F1. And F1 was the uh, expansion coefficient in the effective supergravity action. So we might ask, do we have really achieved our goal? Do we have a relation? Uh, uh, did we get a relation to the topological string? I think if one is uh, very uh, picky, uh, maybe not quite. Uh, so as I just said, uh, if one is here uh, in the way how we derive the, the number of species uh, is nothing else than the higher order correction to the prepotential, which is not really a genus expansion, which I said to you about an expansion in terms of uh, derivatives. But it is strictly speaking not yet connected to the genus one partition function of the topological string. So, in fact, I think in order to make the connection to the topological string, we uh, simply have to make the assertion that the black hole partition function, which we have derived, has to be identified with the uh, topological uh, uh, partition function, with the partition function of the topological string. So, in order to make the uh, agreement perfect, we have to uh, say that VBH is given by uh, the square of the topological the string partition function. And I think this is nothing else than the OSV conjecture. So I think the correspondence uh, between the way how we derive the number of species in terms of one holds precisely if the OSV conjecture is correct. So you can view it in both ways. Um, you can see that in this way, we also give further ev evidence to the OSV conjecture or you say the OSV conjecture is correct, and then we are also deriving the result. So uh, I think I'm at my end. Thank you very much. Yes, uh, I think we have to have at least uh, uh, possibly even three moduli because we are looking at four charge black hole. Uh, one charge is the electric charge, and then we need three uh, three magnetic charges in addition. I'm not quite sure whether you can already do with the uh, Calabria, which has only two vector multiplets.
Okay. Yeah, you're, you're, I think, right. It may, might not apply in this way to all color BIOS. And uh, I think, on the other hand, what, what you did is presumably more general, applies possibly to all possible color BIOS. Okay, here, here we are. Yes. If one is precisely this coefficient. Yeah. No, I think, um, I mean, F1, as, as you point out, and this is also, uh, as we discovered, is, is this particular coefficient. And um, so a priori, this F1 is not uh, related uh, to the topological string, right? Okay, then, then put it in the, we, 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 we needed or we wanted to use the OSV conjecture finally uh, to connect this F1 also um, to the topological string, but maybe this remark is for for you a little bit uh, circular or trivial because, uh, as you have also shown in your work, this F one is precisely is is precisely the, but a priori it is not uh, clear. You have to show first that F one is a topological free energy. Uh, I I don't uh, don't object. <laughs> 